Okay, hi everyone. Dajia uh, hao. Really uh, thrilled uh, you could make it this afternoon. Uh, realize it's such gorgeous weather out there, it's hard to come inside. Uh, maybe we should have done this outside. Uh, Luncheon was admiring that uh, we, we had a seminar going outside in the Watson Center, of course, on such a beautiful day. It makes sense. But uh, anyway, here we are. And um, really glad that you all are here. Um, this is uh, uh, one of a, a series of lectures by the uh, China Initiative. The China Initiative, very busy in this season, if you haven't noticed. There's another uh, major China talk uh, this Thursday, Victor Schur coming from San Diego, and then uh, next week, uh, also a couple of talks. Uh, uh, Zach Cooper will speak on, on uh, t the sensitive Taiwan issue. Uh, and in this series, uh, we'll have Elizabeth Wishnick. Uh, but this is, w what we're trying to do with this talk is, uh, we call this the uh, Project on China's Key Bilateral Relationships. And what we're doing is each semester taking a critical uh, piece of Chinese foreign policy and looking narrowly at that. So this is the uh, first of uh, three talks that we're going to have on that, uh, that so critical uh, China-Russia relationship. Uh, so we're so pleased uh, here. I, I don't think we could have a, a better expert on this subject uh, this afternoon than uh, Professor Lan Xinxiang, who uh, com came down from Cambridge, uh, where he's serving as a, a visiting fellow at, at the Belfer Center at Harvard. But uh, let me, if I can describe his background a little, I think you'll uh, understand why he really is uh, you know, the perfect person to address us on this topic. Um, he is uh, director of the Institute of Security Policy at the China National Institute for SCO, International Exchanges and Judicial Cooperation. Uh, he was born in Nanjing, and a, he's a graduate of Fudan University in Shanghai, if, if some of you know that very prestigious. Chinese University. I've had the uh, pleasure to visit many times. Um, uh, I'm very excited to learn. I didn't know this, but he's a, a graduate of Johns Hopkins Sice. Uh, I am too. <laughs> so uh, we both have our masters from Johns Hopkins. He went on and has a PhD from Sice as well. Um, but for many, many years, he served as a professor at the Graduate Institute of uh, International and Development Studies in Geneva. And uh, there, I believe, he, he he uh, wrote the book, uh, The Quest for Legitimacy in Chinese Politics. Um, so in addition to being a visiting fellow now at, uh, at the Belfer Center, he's also senior fellow at the Stimson Center. Uh, and I just found out that he held the very prestigious Kissinger chair at the Library of Congress, which is a very, very interesting place also to observe U.S.-China relations. So uh, we're thrilled to have him as our first speaker in this series and very anxious to uh, tap his expertise on Europe-China uh, interactions here uh, by asking him some questions about China-Russia relations. I do want to say before we get started, though, uh, although we will be, of course, w w we're trying to really probe the China-Russia relationship, which is absolutely critical, but uh, 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 Professor Xiang has graciously agreed also to share insights on, on other issues that might interest you on China as well. Indeed, I think earlier today he gave a lecture on the 20th Party Congress. So. Uh, he will we'll take uh, questions across the gamut, but, but let's have some good questions on China-Russia relations as well. But please join me in thanking Professor Xiang for visiting us today. Uh, thank you, Lyle, and thank you for uh, Watson Institute uh, for inviting me. Uh, uh, as Lyle just mentioned, that uh, I have been making rounds lately on party congress from Washington, New York, Boston. This is a great change for me. It's a, it's a much more interesting topic. That's because <laughs> I'm a bit uh, tired of uh, uh, explaining party congress, which is wildly misunderstood in any case. But we can debate about that. Uh, here, I simply want to uh, stick to... Uh, the topic here, uh, the topic is uh, Russia and China, unlikely brotherhood. Um, that's, a, that's a title I chose um, for very simple reason. Uh, that's a China-Russian relationship uh, developed uh, this way. Uh, I don't believe any historians 
or even political scientists or international relations experts ha uh, had expected, uh, let's say, even 10 years ago. It's, it's extremely hard to imagine. Uh, when I went to Russia to, to give speeches, um, uh, uh, by the way, I'm part of this Putin thing called the Valde Club, so I go to Russia quite often give speeches. Uh, I usually start with a, uh, a joke only Russians un understood. Uh, I will say, I say US -China, uh, the Chi Russian China relations is the best at the peak today. Uh, then I stopped two seconds and say, since Catherine the Great. Now, Russians got my joke. That's to say, these two nations, or two countries, nothing, they had nothing in common. They hate each other for centuries. Uh, they cannot um, uh, compromise very much on their, not just national interests, but the temperament and almost everything. Uh, somehow they have become the best partner. Okay. I, by the way, I totally agree with Lyle. Uh, the, in the West, people s tend to talk about alliance. That's a total misnomer. There is no alliance. Uh, I don't believe there is uh, any chance they become alliance in the military you know, sense. Uh, but they have somehow become the best partner uh, bilaterally for, for reasons I think, uh, uh, I believe not quite explained uh, very well. Okay. I want to mention a couple of things which is uh, familiar things, but I also want to mention a couple of things which is not quite familiar or not much discussed why we have reached this level. Okay. Now, historically, <coughs> oh, maybe I get my water, sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. Um, first of all, historically, um, China always had a different view about the Russians or Russian people. Um, you may have heard the Chinese uh, since the, the old dynasty period, they call every foreigner, the Europeans, barbarians. But the Russians actually did not even enjoy that title. We, we know Russians even before we know the British or all the others coming to China since the, after the Opium War. Okay. We had a diplomatic treaty even with Russians, which is very few people remember these days. Okay. We'll talk about, of course, the, uh, the Treaty of Nishinsky, uh, 1689. That's way before the British tried to impose a Western system on China. Um, Chinese have a different name for Russians for many, many, many centuries. Um, um, the translation is difficult. I think Chinese understand. It's, it's called Old Harry Man. That's a, uh, 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 Allah Mao's <laughs> for, 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 for Chinese language speaker, you'd understand what I'm saying. It's a unique name for the Russians. For several, it's not a, a, a nice title for the Russians. Uh, they are more than being barbarian, in other words. Uh, they are dangerous, they are threatening, <laughs> uh, because we share borders okay, for many centuries, especially after Tsarist uh, expansion into the East. China and, and the Russian, or Chinese dynasty had so many fights with the Russians. The treaty in Nashinsky, by the way, is the treaty actually settled the border dispute to begin with even though it's not under Westphalian logic at the time. It's, uh, it's a real politique logic. Okay. So to, 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 uh, to, to put my story uh, short, I don't want to go all the way since uh, 16 something. I simply want to uh, emphasize throughout history, the, the two countries have very little uh, real uh, affection of each other. And under communism, we actually had a war, right? We're supposed to be communist ally <laughs> during the 50s and 60s. That's the only war, serious war, aside from the Korean War, it's different. But uh, we had with Russia, it's over the border dispute. Okay. 
How many border disputes we have? Very few people uh, in the West know or they don't even care. Okay. Here I want to emphasize why China and the Russian relationship improved so much in the last 20 or so years. This is a, a very important factor you should keep in mind. That's under Putin, under Putin, there is a long dragging process of secret diplomacy between China and the Russia over the historical dispute on territories. How many of them? I used to think 7,000, my data shows it's a 7,700, big or small. <laughs> you think about the long board, everything, over river, over land. Over, uh, you, you. But uh, at, at one meeting, I was at uh, Sochi uh, in the same room with uh, Putin. Uh, Putin actually correct my data. He said 8,000, he said. <laughs> um, that's a shocking. But, you know, in a way, so nobody comments on that. Of course, I'm not... Let me quote what Putin's, you know, uh, complaint, of course. Nobody give us Nobel Peace Prize, right? How many left? How many disputes was settled? How many left today? Seven and a half. Okay. Now, that is a great achievement for a bilateral territorial dispute. No matter how you look at it, <laughs> it is a major contribution to peace for the two powers who could end up many possibility for them to go to war. Territorial dispute, we all know. Even small one could, uh, you know, uh, trigger some major conflict. So this is one foundation I think uh, has been uh, neglected uh, when they talk about uh, why China and Russia are coming close together. Um, American factor, which I will discuss, of course, uh, is not the only thing. Okay. Yes, American factor or U.S. factor is very, very crucial as well, pushing these two together. That, of course, is for very, very pragmatic geopolitical reasons. For some reason, after the Cold War, uh, United States, at least from my perspective or from China perspective, uh, seem to have made a decision to somehow um, squeeze as much as they can the living uh, space of Russia, at least from a Russian point of view. Um, uh, the NATO enlargement, uh, when the uh, 1998, I believe, at that point, uh, that decision was made, China also panicked at least for six or eight months. I, I, I remember at that time I was invited by one of the advisors who served, uh, a Chen Zemin's advisor to, to write something. I, I believe I wrote something. They said, they, we want to know how NATO enlargement will get affecting China. Are they going to move all the way to the East Asian? And the, what is the trend for the West, for NATO? Um, so. At that moment, NATO enlargement already alert Chinese enormously. But of course, from the Western point of view, uh, NATO enlargement has nothing to do with uh, the current war in Ukraine. That I think no one in China, I'm talking about not just uh, leaders, but also scholars or, or elite policymakers, nobody believes that is, that is the case, at least you have to look at history seriously. You have to look at what George Kennan said, which uh, at that time predicted what the Russian behavior might become. So I really ha have difficulty to understand uh, why that episode of history is being somehow written off. Um, now, this is another reason Chinese look at the NATO behavior they certainly began to worry about the Taiwan side of the story, or the East Asian side, the Pacific side. Um, so the, um, what the Chinese uh, policymakers now call the, uh, salami slicing strategy. Um, in Europe, squeeze Russian space. 
in Asia, it's a Chinese space. So this logic also helped pushing them together for very, uh, uh, in my view, it's a geostrategic reasons. It's not even, there is no ideology there. Yeah, no ideology there. So this is um, the uh, U.S. factor. Now, but the other point I want to emphasize for the U.S. government in recent years is they decide to alienate or make both China and the Russia uh, the, the, uh, the chief enemy or target. China actually now elevate to be number one uh, at the same time. Now, uh, this is a logic, again, I think it's very difficult for me or for many Chinese policymakers to understand. Uh, as Henry Kissinger said many, many times, even during the Cold War, you, you don't do that. Uh, you, you try to s drive some kind of a wedge right, between uh, uh, Moscow and, and the Beijing, and it usually worked. The greatest uh, strategic triangle in the 70s worked wonders, actually. But somehow Americans, the uh, U.S. in particular, U.S. government in particular, last uh, two governments uh, seem to uh, decide they can afford to abandon that um, strategy. So pitting the U.S. or they try to use what they call democratic alliance to create two block politics, basically. Uh, that, of course, from a Chinese point of view, there, China actually had very little room to maneuver. Uh, for, for, for the war in Ukraine, if we can discuss more on the war if, if you want to, but um, China hesitated, really, at the beginning to really support Russia. China, it's unthinkable China will support a new type of a Brezhnev doctrine, uh, which China hated most, is you invading another brotherly country just by, you know, tanks. The, the Czechoslovakia event, 1968, is the direct trigger of our board, uh, border war between China and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, it's not because of terrorism, but that's triggered by the Czech, Czech, Czech invasion at the time. China tried to fight back the Brezhnev doctrine. Uh, somehow they have no maneuvering room. It's, uh, in the end, they have to acquiesce what Russians have uh, been doing. Okay. It's unfortunate. China put itself in the uh, unfortunate situation, but I do not see there is any chance that situation will change uh, because simply they don't have sufficient room to play. The other side of the story I want to emphasize again is American under Biden administration, actually, uh, escalate quite quickly, quite steadily, of uh, uh, supporting not Taiwan independence. That's the exaggeration. It's kind of de facto um, one China, one Taiwan policy. They are not pursuing two China. They are not pursuing really what they call the one China policy. Uh, they are choosing some kind of uh, strategy in between, one China and two China. From Chinese point of view, um, that's something they will never be able to accept. Yeah. This is a war-provoking uh, strategy uh, and seem to be escalating uh, steadily, especially since uh, Nancy uh, Pelosi's visit. So all these things, when you put together, you, you, can, you look at the, the, the relationship between uh, Moscow and the Beijing, uh, of course they have to push together. They have to become more and more uh, collaborative on many, many issues. Yeah. I want to emphasize another part of the story here. It's the, uh, um, the Russian, China is also watching Russian behavior, the recent uh, actions very, very closely. Battleground is total disappointment, like everybody else. <laughs> Uh, how come the world number two military become uh, maybe number 10? I don't know. Um, Chinese military also uh, totally surprised by it. Uh, I, uh, I organized track two in, in the summer 
I have uh, PRA generals, I have uh, NATO generals, not American NATO generals, just uh, talking about the bat battleground situation. Uh, Chinese uh, side, uh, Chinese generals are totally uh, 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 frustrated <laughs> how bad the Russian military, we used to know Russian military better than Western uh, you know, military uh, authorities because we had a collaborative relationship between the Russian military and the Chinese. But they th we th used to think the Russians are doing that. So battleground is a bad news, but the Russian capability of dealing with the, 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 the unprecedented sanctions, the measures they took, the Chinese are learning very, very carefully, especially the financial policy, central bank. The lady, uh, she is the famous uh, central banker. I think she maybe is the, one of the best <laughs> in the world, no matter what you say. <laughs> Morally, uh, her strategy seemed to have worked wonders of defending ruble. Uh, of course, Chinese, we have more cards to play. Supposedly, we attack Taiwan, you start the sanctions because of economic power and also economic relations with, with the West. But still, uh, China are learning a lot from the... Uh, uh, that, that is another factor. They are watching each other very, very closely. Now, the most recent development, unfortunately, is uh, that could create some cracks uh, between the two is the Putin's reckless talk about uh, nuclear weapons. This is something I think is becoming increasingly difficult for Chinese uh, government to uh, uh, to endorse, even in the vague sense. The Chinese have to make some stand on that issue, and Putin understands that. He understands that. Because from th this is, of course, the nuclear doctrine question. Uh, I don't want to elaborate too much, but you know the superpower, the, the, the two former superpowers, U.S. and the Soviet Union, <coughs> they never give up the so-called first use doctrine of the, uh, of the nuclear weapons. They never say we renounce first use. China always say we never going to use first un unless you use against me, right? So it's called... A no first use doctrine. But with this Putin's behavior, we are entering a new era, even if he did not use it in the end. Or whether or not Chinese will change that doctrine from so called proportional deterrence, what's what De Gaulle used to call proportional deterrence. We, proportional meaning we're only focusing on one or two major cities. Chinese military doctrine against US. For strategic weapons, you know, we used to say Los Angeles, Los Angeles, and Los Angeles. We only uh, take out Los Angeles, so you, you cannot, uh, it, that's the tolerance level. We think Americans cannot tolerate, <laughs> therefore there is a deterrence value, right? Um, that's for second strike, of course. But now the issue is, are we going to abandon no first use altogether? That will transform the entire military doctrine and even force posture for the People's Liberation Army. So it's not something that the Chinese are facing an uh, enormous challenge on that. So this is, I think, it's, uh, uh, the result of this uh, war in Ukraine. Now, will China support Russia militarily? I personally, I do not see it. Russians really need now are the drones. Chinese drones actually is better than Iranians. <laughs> it's more accurate. I don't believe uh, Xi Jinping would be willing to sign off a massive shipment of uh, the Chinese uh, AI. Uh, you know, here I, I want to emphasize the high tech side because the Chinese AI seem to be moving extremely you know, quick, quickly. Uh, Pentagon even said maybe in certain area of military usage, the Chinese already surpassed that of the United States. Uh, yes, we can, if, if we want to, supply even more effective 
drones to take out high mice, uh, high Mars, all the other stuff. But China will never do that. I don't believe they will risk that. It's not just uh, alienate the United States. I, I personally, I believe Xi Jinping has gave up on Biden already. Um, <laughs> if you want to know why, I can explain more. Uh, because the Jakarta G20 is coming. Uh, used to be Chinese are far more anxious for summits. Because this would be the first physical summit between Xi Jinping and, <laughs> and now it's the Biden side saying, let's work out agenda. Chinese seem to say, what's for? <laughs> uh, because the Taiwan issue. Because the escalation of the Taiwan issue. So, so here I want to say is that uh, um, <clears throat> the relationship between Moscow and the Beijing in the foreseeable future, generally speaking, I would not see any serious cracks coming. If there is cracks coming, there would be no public statement seriously on, in any way on China's side to criticize Putin, as long as there is no progress on Taiwan negotiations between you. Uh, U.S. and China. These two things are so closely linked now. Um, here you can see the 20th Party Congress now, the, the, the new Politburo makeup. I think uh, Washington Post or some American press exaggerate a little bit. Uh, they say basically it's new Politburo is a war cabinet. Missiles, Taiwan, and espionage. That's the three key words. Uh, American press commenting on uh, Chinese uh, new leadership is not accurate. But I cannot deny the fact that this is a national security cabinet, almost like a war cabinet <laughs> or semi-war cabinet, but also they are probably at the stage of expediting the preparation for a potential military conflict over the Taiwan issue. So at this next couple of years, now remember the Americans have, uh, have all these deadlines. Uh, the uh, Pacific Command, I think Davison, uh, at the, uh, General Davison says 2027 is the deadline Chinese are going to attack Taiwan. Uh, but I just heard uh, Admiral uh, Gildai in Washington uh, lately. He said, no, no, Davison probably is more optimistic. 23, 24 is more like, wow. <laughs> uh, I said, say, what, what's the evidence? Where is the evidence? But it is not impossible, though. But I doubt it's going to be planned that way. It could well be, uh, under the circumstances, accidental uh, event. Then trigger, then escalate. Yeah. There is no mechanism between US and China uh, unlike during the Cold War between U.S. and the Soviet Union, there is no escalation management system exists today. The communication is also pretty much cut off uh, between U.S. and China. Now, I, I mentioned this is, of course, a part of my discussion of the U.S. factor. Um, Chinese ambassador in Washington only a few days ago was it become news, but I knew that for quite a few. Who was here for a year and a half? The new ambassador who was completely cut off from access, even talking to senior officials. Uh, it never happened during the Cold War. Kissinger kept a tunnel open for Dobrinin, uh, Russian ambassador. If there is something want to talk, you don't have to see be noticed by the press, right? <laughs> you go straight to see. Somehow Biden team uh, decide not even allow any serious access. Um, so that is uh, frustrating for, from a Chinese point of view. There is, they, don't, they don't talk seriously anymore. When they do talk, they talk consistently past each other. Uh, think about Anchorage, starting with Anchorage, right? <laughs> Uh, Alaska, the first uh, supposedly important uh, conversation, turned out to be a shouting match in the end. Um, and there are several other bilateral talks that yield nothing. 
I think one problem the Chinese are frustrated when dealing with the uh, United States, which is the question of the uh, Biden administration's key concept, that is the um, uh, democracy versus autocracy is at the core of American national security strategy. Now, when you do great power politics based on ideological issues, I'm not uh, saying ideological issues not important. The human rights, uh, all these uh, issues are important. I personally, I also wrote quite a few things in English, of course, mostly criticizing uh, the Chinese uh, policies on a uh, well, variety of issues. Um, but you cannot bet the geopolitical you know, issues or your national security issues uh, pinned on the, uh, the, the ideological questions. The conversation China and the U.S. are having now, in most cases, are the U.S. side, you know, making accusations, one, two, three, four, five, you know, basically like that. There's nothing practical they're talking about. Now, with Russia, of course, it's a totally different picture. They are, uh, there's not much ideological uh, thing going on. You see, the, the, I, I think I want to conclude by saying there's a one misunderstanding in the U.S. in particular about this relationship is that they believe Russia and China represent a model that challenge the Western order or Western democracy. Uh, that is something I think I cannot believe it's, it's true, okay? Um, because communist system lost attraction for everywhere in the world. You think Chinese is still communist? Of course, that you, you, you don't know China, right? <laughs> so I, I, nothing I can say. I, I wrote a book about legitimacy question of China, how to define. Um, it's, yes, it is still one party uh, dictatorship. It is still, uh, but how, how big difference from today's system and the uh, dynastic, old dynastic system in terms of the policy making and so on. Uh, I would say much closer to that than to a typical uh, communist uh, dictatorship. Okay. Besides, because communists have no attraction in the world, the model has, has no, is no longer a valid for influencing other people in the world, not to mention uh, the uh, people in the West. When Khrushchev uh, says, we will bury you, uh, when they had this, this kitchen debate with uh, Nixon, at that time, actually, there are a lot of echoes, even in the U.S., not to mention the Third World, other countries, because you have a left-wing movement, you have unions, you have, uh, even you have a big, well, you know, these uh, later, the, the generation, anti-war generation and the civil rights movement, they're actually sympathetic with that view. Okay. Today, I don't believe any socialist or communist model is, uh, uh, can really compete with market economic model per se. So Chinese will not abandon the strategy of opening, except, of course, the, what they're trying to do is so-called or more a regulated opening, or Xi Jinping's new concept is called systemic opening, <laughs> systemic opening uh, uh, project. The real danger for democracy is within. Okay. Uh, China policy, maybe Russian policy, but I'm just saying this is what the Chinese uh, uh, feeling, or m my own feeling, China policy is almost hijacked by your domestic politics. Washington is a town where everybody competes who is more hawkish these days. It's unprecedented. I never believe I will see this day. You, anyone become more and more hawkish as getting a political credit. Uh, it's uh, it's absurd situation. China policy is the only handle in Washington, D.C. that can maintain some kind of facade of bipartisanship. I've Honestly, I do not see any other serious issue. There is a bipartisanship anymore. 
in Europe, you pitting your national strategy as an autocracy versus democracy may end up with European countries moving the voters uh, to, the, to the right, which is already taking place. Italy, I, I'm afraid Germany uh, as well, in the end, not to mention several other countries. That's a real danger, a real challenge to democracy. I, I'm a lo I love democracy per se, but democracy is not a software you just put on the machine, it works everywhere. <laughs> you have to, uh, to, you have to re-identify the root cause. Okay, I, I, I'm finished already. So this is where I think China-Russian uh, relationship is unlikely brotherhood because they are not based on ideology at all. There is no ideological talk even between them. So therefore, it's not a, a autocracy versus a democracy challenge. Okay, I stop here. I'm just talking off my head. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can maybe sit down. I'll, I'll sit down. Yeah, relax, relax a little bit. I hope uh, we'll have a lot of great questions uh, from the audience here. Maybe I'll kick things off with, with uh, one or two, though. Um, uh, Lan Xin, I was fascinated <laughs> by your observation that, um, that China already was uh, kind of worried about NATO in the 90s. I yes. find that uh, quite amazing. Um, but in the last few years, even before the war in Ukraine, NATO was already leaning toward the Asia Pacific. So right. uh, is that part of Beijing's uh, calculus war. these days? Did that have a major impact? You know, we, we saw the British carrier. Uh, and, and one more question. Sure, if you, yeah. I can't resist asking you about where does Belt and Road stand? You know, I mean, if you look at a map, Russia is a big part of Belt and Road. How is Belt and Road impacted by the war in Ukraine? Uh, well, the second question is obviously it, it, it was impact, uh, uh, but uh, mainly, mainly because we had enormous investment in Ukraine before the war. Mm. China did not gain much, you know. Yeah. Ukraine is the biggest country, or I think we had the biggest investment in the former Soviet sphere. It's Ukraine, and Kazakhstan, uh, you know, and so on. So, yes, it's not a happy situation. But it did not, uh, not yet affecting the tra transit routes. Uh, remember, we have now the, uh, uh, the freight, you know, on, on, on the rail freight, and the many other routes uh, so far has not been uh, greatly affected. Not yet, not yet. Mm. But also in Central Asia, Central Asian countries, they are not all supporting the war in Ukraine. So they actually want to invite, remember Central Asia is our focus in this part of the world for the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. Um, so China still get more opportunities to invest or to, to do things, trade with um, the Central Asian countries. So, um, well, Africa and many other parts, it's a different story. But uh, they are not quite affected by the war itself. Now, you, you talk about the NATO members try to show a flag in support of the American uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. I personally do not see Chinese take that too seriously, mm. uh, British in particular. This is a typical British uh, east of Suez, uh, the old dream when the British in such a trouble. I think the Chinese understood that. Um, British excessively active in attacking the Hong Kong issue, and the British also claim that they, they, we are still far east and you know navy power. It's it's just a nostalgie. Oh no, sorry, the French called it, a nostalgic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter that much. The uh, uh, even even Americans don't really take that seriously. Austin uh, humiliated British when they sent the, the uh, carrier uh, to, 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 to Asia. Right? <laughs> I was there <laughs> listening to Austin in Singapore. Um, British is so shocked that Austin said, basically, go home. <laughs> you know, one carrier here, you better go back and defend, you know, <laughs> there. I mean, the Russians are there. 
So that's not a big deal. Uh, the French, if you want me to give you, the French side story is different because the French is really is a Pacific power today. Uh, but the French still own quite a few islands in you know, South Pacific. So the French are actually making a better case, saying we need Charles de Gaulle to be there. But they are not provoking Chinese in that way, you know, we, because there is always a special link between Paris and, uh, and Beijing. We, we talk behind the scenes, as they say. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Germany, of course, uh, uh, they don't do very much. So, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Uh, yes. How about some questions yes. from the audience? Yeah, yes, sure. Sir, yes. Go yes. Ahead. I have a son who has been working in Shanghai for oh. over a decade. Well. And I, I sort of express a concern as a dad in terms of, of uh, well, you mentioned Germany and <coughs> Volkswagen having a huge footprint, right. Right. Uh, manufacturing footprint in, in mainland China. Right. What is the outlook for either cooperation or strategic retreat of, let's say, big global companies like Volkswagen uh -huh. and others, are they going to stay? Or they, how, And how do you measure that? And, and who, what's the outlook? Um, well, our outlook actually is not so bad. Uh, if you look at what Schultz visit, you know, what he is able to achieve. As, as, a, as the EU strategy, uh, they now says we need to reduce dependency, the, the level of dependency on China market. That's the official line every EU member is supposed to agree. But then each country has their own way of doing their things. Uh, for example, you know, Schultz went there. Well, he got uh, what? Uh, well, uh, 190 Airbus, right? I mean, that, that's also important for... for uh, the, uh, he got a breakthrough for the uh, Pfizer because uh, Chinese for three years of the COVID, the, the, there is no foreign uh, vaccine there. It's supposed to be a good, you know, gi giant market, right? So mm -hmm. he has done quite a few things. I, he has the most top, the most important CEOs of Germany there, which means they are intent still to expand things. They're going to cut... What? They're going to cut high-tech, that's for sure. That's part of the transatlantic deal of uh, high-tech control. They don't want to transfer uh, the high-tech uh, uh, into China for what American demands as uh, security reasons and so on and so forth. So certain area will be cut, but other area may not. Uh, besides, I think the business community are still relatively confident even with this war cabinet uh, there, they began to realize that Chinese probably is not going to go back as Wall Street General or a journal or some other people <laughs> say, go back to planned economy. That is over. There is no chance Chinese will go back to planned economy. I, I don't see it. I don't see it. They're actually starting opening financial sector. They're opening medical hosp hospital sector. And the most impressive is the opening tourist sector, even. I never thought that this <laughs> happened too fast. Uh, it, that's a huge business, by the way, because <laughs> the Chinese uh, capital monopolized every travel agency in China for, you know, let's say Europeans are so keen on Chinese, because the Europeans are always telling me, please, only 1% of Chinese coming to Europe, it's a, it will be over. Uh, well, um, all our facilities, right? <laughs> so, uh, but the, the used to be Chinese travel agency are the ones who organize group trips, organize everything. Main part of the profits goes only to Chinese. Now they open only a couple of weeks ago. So many, many areas are regulated, but they are opening. Probably opening even bigger. The, the, the door will be even bigger, in my view. But other area, you know, depends on which sector you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, how, do you, how do you see uh, the uh, China and uh, Russia relationship developing in um, Africa? Uh, personally, I actually have not seen any serious collaboration there uh, because Russians are doing totally different things. 
uh, China do infrastructure mainly, and uh, and uh, mining the resources, and also we we are doing a lot of agriculture in Africa. Um, Twenty thirty years ago, probably no more than hundred thousand Chinese in the African continent. Now I was told. I used to run another center called Belt Road Center. I travel 30% of these countries, which is about 25 countries. So, yes, the Russians only do one or two things, you see. They, they, they don't have much... Uh, uh, in, we are not overlapping in, in, in many areas. So I, I do not see there is a serious collaboration. Now, it worries Americans, of course, is they think... Well, China has its base in Djibouti. Maybe militarily they're going to do some joint stuff. No, I doubt. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Interesting question. Yeah, sir. Yeah, um, I was wondering uh, your thoughts about uh, how yeah. China views Russia's uh, attacking the infrastructure of Ukraine. Uh, I, uh, I. Official line the Chinese made is always we don't like the idea of attacking civilians, uh, attacking infrastructure, uh, utility facilities. The Chinese all repeat all the time on that. But it, they are not happy, of course, because remember, a lot of infrastructures built by China yeah. <laughs> after Ukraine become independent. Um, including, uh, yes, some uh, electronic, you know, uh, plants. And, uh, um, so it's, it is a bad situation. But uh, China, at this moment, and in the foreseeable, they will never make it public, say, uh, naming Russia. You know, they only disagree with Russia in principle, they would say. But they will never name it. <laughs> Russia did this. It's not going to happen unless you U.S. China relationship somehow improve. Yes, sorry. Um, Do we have, okay. So this <coughs> sorry. Enlightenment Brotherhood, you would argue, is based on- Sorry, can we get to on the mic or? Yeah. <coughs> um, so this Unlikely Brotherhood, you would argue, is based on uh, U.S. China relationship and U.S. Russia relationship. And in an alternative world, what does a different U.S.-China relationship look like? Well, let's go back to uh, so-called strategic ambiguity. That will be my, my suggestion. Um, uh, what, what Biden administration is doing is, is uh, pursuing what's called strategic clarity. Uh, clarity means you s specify what American going to do if there is, uh, you know, conflict, you know, Taiwan uh, military action. Strategic ambiguity actually worked more than 40 years. Uh, I, I personally, I do not, Chinese understood that logic, and they actually take that logic, strategic ambiguity, as part of the American deterrence, you see, which actually worked not deterrence to two sides, both Taiwan and mainland China. That's what Americans have been doing the past 40 years until recently they are seem to be abandoning this. So when you're abandoning strategic ambiguity, you have a president who supposedly have a tongue slip. Now your tongue slip, one time fine, twice a great, four times, right? Uh, that's President Biden says, yes, yes, very affirmatively. We're going to defend Taiwan, meaning we, meaning U.S. military. That's what understood in Beijing. Uh, say, well, then, of course, you have Jake Sullivan walk it back you know, four times, but where is the credibility when you have this kind of statement all the time? So they need to seriously discuss what your intention is on Taiwan. Let's put this thing on the table. Uh, I must say uh, Chinese policymakers still have some grudging, I know maybe you don't like to hear, grudging admiration of Mr. Uh, Trump, even today. Um, however crazy he may be, Trump put his cards on the table. You see, he is not using this very vague language. And the Trump is not talking about ideology at all. Right? <laughs> okay, he ended up uh, 
you know, because of COVID, he, he, he gone crazy. He, he using Kung Fu flu, you know, the, this kind of racist attack on China. But otherwise, <laughs> we can deal, uh, the Chinese elite will say, we can deal with Trump. We cannot, we don't know how to deal with Biden. You see that? You understand what I'm trying to say here? Yeah, okay. Please, yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, could we yes, get the yes. microphone? Yeah, we, have a mic. we want to make sure people online can hear. <coughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Harry Kissinger always speak of balance of the power yeah. is essential for right. world peace. Right. right. Now, since the fall of Berlin Wall, yes. there has been only one <coughs> world power. Yeah. So it seems to be intrinsically unstable. Right. And so now the Chinese, the partner with the Russian, yeah. and you think uh, the city will be more balanced, maybe paradoxically will be less chance for world war. Oh. Yes. No, that's very good uh, 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 IR theory question, of course. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I think it's a good somebody can, can restrain uh, any headstrong power. Um, there is a need to restrain China. You know, we recent recent years we have something called a wolf warrior diplomacy, which for me is absurd. Okay, I'm I'm a leading critic on that. You can still find it, my long long interview uh, in Chinese, but of course, then translate by the Canadians into English and the French. <laughs> so, uh, almost ten page interview I attacking that, but. That means Chinese also in recent years become quite headstrong, uh, overestimate, in my view, uh, their own capacity. So you need somebody, you know, to restrain. And in this area, United States actually is uh, necessary. And the Europeans have done even better uh, job in that area. Schultz, you can see Schultz visit this time. Uh, the Europeans are playing this uh, game very, very well. Unlike the U.S., I, I put it a very uh, simple way. You talk about human rights, you go to China, you say, what's your problem, so on and so forth. The American approach has always been State Department pub publish every year a document, name, each country poking everybody in the eye. <laughs> Is that useful? No, there's <laughs> no effect. Uh, so this is, I think, yes, uh, unipolar world is a fantasy anyway. But American made a mistake, I think. They entertain unipolar fantasy too much. They believe when the Cold War ended, that's the all leading to the, you know, the NATO enlargement, all these decisions. Um, it's a kind of triumphalism. Remember Fukuyama, you know, kind of argument, end of history. End of history. Even Fukuyama himself doesn't believe it anymore. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. <coughs> um, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I'm wondering whether you think that uh, structural factors might, uh, structural changes might affect uh, China-Russia relations in the future. For example, yeah. would Russia worry about, for example, uh, China taking advantage of a weaker Russia as it rises? Thank you. Well, it's ha this has been a thesis almost more than 20 years. You know especially the Russian nationalists have been making that argument. Uh, I understand the Russian fear, especially the Chinese migration, uh, because there is a major depopulation trend in the far eastern part of Russia. Right? They lost a lot of population, moved to the European side. Then they're facing Heilongjiang province, one province. That's almost 100 million people there. So imagination is that just a small portion of that cross the Amur River that, you know, they're going to colonize. No, um, I actually listened to Putin personally says that is a fantasy, you know, Chinese, think about this, Chinese will never be able to do that, uh, not uh, causing a war with Russia, why they want to. So is, is Russia junior partner? That's been American thesis for a long time, but they underestimate one important thing, that uh, not only Russia is still the top uh, military power, one of the, well, until Ukraine war, we still think it's number two, right? Uh, military power, fully nuclear, uh, you know. But also, Russia, Russian economy and Chinese economy 
are basically complementary to each other to the extent more than any other, you know, bilateral trade relationship. Russian sells anything to China Chinese would like to have, not two things, resources and the weapon. Because the Russian produced bad consumer goods that nobody wanted anyway, right? So, and the China selling consumer goods, manufacturing products. And in Russia has a, you know, that's a, also a very big market there. Yeah. Okay. So it's not that a junior partner as they imagined. Yes. Uh, let me ask a quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, but you can give the microphone here, but uh, yeah. just, uh, you know, lunch <coughs> and your, your uh, background is so uh, yeah. impressive and you, you have an experience that many of us don't have. Uh, to be very candid, no, I don't right. think any of us have been in the room with Vladimir Putin, uh, whereas <laughs> you have been in a room, uh, okay, maybe a few people, Ma you've been in the room with P Putin many times. So, uh, so one question I think many of us would ask you is, you know, what, what, how do you assess this uh, person as a leader? How, how does he, uh, is, you know, many of us are afraid that he could be, you know, becoming irrational, you know, and this is a man who wow. has the finger on the button. A uh, second question is, um, again, given your incredible experience and knowledge of diplomacy, uh, how do you see the war ending? <laughs> <laughs> Easy questions. Uh, no, no, no. The, uh, up until the war, uh, my, I, yeah, I usually see him once or twice a year, uh, Vladivostok and Sochi. Uh, now, my basic impression is to use the word cold-blooded if it's not too bad. Yes, uh, he is cold-blooded, but an extraordinarily rational person. Uh, sharpness. Uh, he can answer any question you, you raise. It's, uh, I never imagined our leader, I mean Chinese, uh, would even uh, uh, answer a question that way, right? The Chinese like to behave like an emperor, you know, that, rather than <laughs> as a political leader. Remember Chinese elite also have a grudging admiration of Putin, not just the Xi Jinping. Remember, Putin it was elected. Don't forget, don't ever underestimate that fact. Elected, it's not a rigged election. When you think about Putin come to power, he is actually popularly elected. Now, do they manipulate his power, you know, surprise, surprise him? Yes, of course. But the Chinese system, where is the election? <laughs> I, okay, it's not Chatham House, so I don't. Well, I stop here. So, <laughs> sorry, but I'm, I say it's grudging admiration. That's a reality, including people like me, but also people who work in China. Now, the second question: How the war ended? <laughs> Nobody knows. My sense, I can only say based on my sense, probably end will end faster than many estimates. Um, what I see what Putin trying to do now is that he seems to have triggered a mechanism. Uh, most Russian experts in the US or military experts uh, do not pay too much, uh, much attention. I don't know if you agree with me, a concept called uh, escalation management strategy, uh, which has been with Russian ch Joint Chiefs, uh, Chief of Staff for mo over 30 years, uh, they, they actually start formulating that strategy since the Afghan war, since their Afghan war. <laughs> How to manage escalation for the purpose to de-escalate. Mm. Okay, that's the concept of chief staff. Americans, nobody take that seriously because US never had that thing. You, what you had for in the Vietnam war and other war, Afghanistan, you called a surge which is escalation of war. You don't do escalation of management for the purpose of de-escalate. Meaning de-escalate here means you force the other side, sit down to the table, eventually talk about it. Okay. That's what voting is heightened this tension so, so high. I, I think the uh, several steps we will continue to see. He will reach the highest point of even uh, shoot a couple of uh, tech uh, weapons, tech nuclear weapons, not on Ukraine, but somewhere else, maybe Arctic, I don't know, just to, to heighten that threat. And the, the bet, the Russian side, the bet is Europe cannot sustain this winter. 
object, not just the gas and so on, economically, uh, it's going to be difficult. Uh, look at the Schultz uh, visit this time. Okay. Uh, one important thing Schultz said is we don't like block politics, which is exactly what Americans seem to be doing. Now, as for a German leader to say that, we're not taking sides between China and the you know, US. That is, this is not Angela Merkel, this is a Schultz. Okay. Merkel, I understand, but the Schultz say that. So it's a European, transatlantic, uh, that's what I'm trying to say, transatlantic solidarity on Ukraine is going to crack. This is the calculation. May work, may work. I don't know. Uh, on a similar note, um, how right. is the Western reaction on uh, Russia's war in Ukraine have implications for China and Taiwan? And um, <coughs> do you think that's why these projections are now going to be accelerated? Are we just delaying the inevitable? Uh, just, uh, sorry, I'm a little, you said, uh, can you just summarize very quickly what, what, what's your question? I'm sorry, I did, yeah. <laughs> You're good. Um, yeah. So, uh, I guess, now that Finland and Sweden are planning on joining NATO, um, how, what are the implications for China potentially attacking Taiwan in the future? You mean Ukraine joined NATO, you talk about? Uh, no, 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 it's fin Finland and Sweden. Oh, oh Finland and Sweden. No, that's a totally different uh, scenario. You know, Finland, Sweden. If I were Finns, I would. I would do <laughs> Finland, Finland in particular. It's a natural development. But uh, you try to say how that affected the China Taiwan policy. Mm -hmm. No, Taiwan policy is totally different. It's it's an island. <laughs> it's not a giant country like the Ukraine. You know, plain. You, there is no mountain even <laughs> in the Ukraine, right? Uh, uh, if there is a war, it would be a completely different kind of warfare. Uh, besides, Chinese position has always been this is a continuation of civil war. Uh, this is not, uh, by even by international law, Taiwan has no legal status in whatever sense. So I would not think the NATO enlargement this time ha had any impact on Chinese uh, strategic uh, and military planning at all. I do not believe Chinese are very keen on that. They want to avoid military solution as much as they can. Uh, but they worry about the U.S. Uh, expediting that trend. Maybe today's uh, Nancy Pelosi, well, if Blinken goes there, I'm pretty much sure we'll trigger something far more serious. No, I I'm just saying. It looks, you know, they, they believe this is what the U.S. is doing. Maybe yeah. I can follow up that question yeah. uh, with another point. I mean, right. as I've seen it, uh, you know, NATO and, and the United States have, have yeah. demonstrated a lot of um, yeah. of new weaponry and, you know, uh, the use of intelligence, for example, in kind of strategic ways, mm -hmm. targeting and so forth. And I just, I wonder, do you think that, uh, I mean, a lot. I think the conventional wisdom here is that Mm. That uh, this is kind of a strong deterrence message to, to China. You mean you you mean the recent exposure of Chinese strategic forces? These bases is what you they, they actually publish it. All the Chinese uh, uh, missile sites base is is what you're referring to? No, you, no, you're no. Not, I'm I'm that, referring more toward okay. to, yeah. you know a kind of sense that for example the yeah. the HIMARS system. Ah, right. Yeah. We've talked actually Asia Pacific specialists know about HIMARS a long time ago sure. because it's yes. already talked about in the, okay. in, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. in the Asia Pacific context. Sure. So the sure. question is, you know, yeah. do you think China's leaders are kind of sobered by what they've seen? Um, or as you put it, uh, that's an interesting idea. You said that it's an yeah. island, so it's totally different. Um, yeah. yeah, Taiwan already get uh, anti-missile you know, system. They get uh, what, 16, uh, six battalion, I try to remember how many. Uh, they already had the anti-missile system uh, on the island. Uh, I personally, I do not believe it added that much of the deterrence value as uh, Mr. Uh, Austin, General Austin, tried to say. Yeah. Uh, he used the term uh, integrate deterrence, you know, has this kind of high-tech platform of this. Don't forget Chinese high-tech also account as a countermeasure. Chinese, especially in terms of for example, HIMARS, HIMARS 
a deadly enemy, of course, is the drones. Um, you don't, <laughs> you you cannot detect drones. I mean, it's especially the the concept of uh, what do you call the mass deployment of drones. Uh, there was a swarm. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, China can easily produce a, a huge uh, supply of uh, a high tech uh, swarm uh, uh, drones. Now, for the ocean, for let's say Navy side, which Pentagon already. Uh, uh, recognize the underwater, the uh, uh, wh what do you call this? An uh, unmanned vehicle, right? The, the, these uh, unmanned vehicle, which can actually can live under there, like like a little bug, live there for five years. With the Chinese had that kind of, I don't know, some kind of uh, batteries. I uh, uh, try to you you the experts on military things, but. <laughs> Well, in any case, they, right. <laughs> they suspect the Chinese already have that technology. You have all these things under the water. Yeah. So when the um, American ships there, at any time, they would be able to attack. And also for the reconnaissance, they would know American. But it was high precision. So China is not Russia in that sense. Yeah. The Russian military weapon system, uh, surprisingly, is quite, quite uh, backward, except that the long-range missiles and maybe supersonic, you know, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the other stuff are not great. So it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's very different. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, folks, we've covered a lot of ground. If some people need to leave early, well, we have another uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So I think, yeah. uh, you know, we have an incredible expert. <coughs> so please, uh, if you have some questions, don't be afraid. Tee it up, yes. sir. Do you think the war could be ended just like the Korean? Korean War, you know, uh, and, uh, never stop at the... Um, personally, if, if you ask my personal opinion, mm -hmm. Korean War ended up with Panmunjom ceasefire agreement, which is good. C ceasefire still is a ceasefire, not a peace treaty, but still lasted, what, 65 years, right? Uh, even though they never re resolved problems. But I doubt there will be a ceasefire agreement. What I see it... Putin will be satisfied. I may be wrong here. If it's a Kashmir solution, good enough for him. Uh, Kashmir means line of control, kind of, because nobody is going to recognize the four sham uh, whatever <laughs> you know, uh, referendum. Uh, no matter how good the relation between China and Russia, I, I've been telling uh, Russian friends, don't expect Chinese to publicly recognize at the UN, that's like a, like a Korean, North Korean Kim, Kim actually, they recognize <laughs> that's part of Russia. China can never do that. So nobody, including China, will deny the legitimacy of that four republics. Right, I mean, so the best thing to do is line of control. Maybe continue the fiction, but no war. Indian Pakistan, Kashmir, remember, Indian Pakistan had several clashes over the Kashmir, had one serious uh, little war, but on the whole, it holds. I mean, uh, it's not that bad. That, that's, that's my view. I, I may be wrong. <laughs> I may be wrong. Mm -hmm. I will say both Ukraine and Russia probably end up satisfied because Ukraine will continue to assert we don't lose territory. We don't recognize. So that may be, may be the case. <laughs> Can you comment on uh, yes. uh, India? And, uh, <coughs> there, there was an article in the New York Times, I don't know if right. you saw it today, where they said India could be a, moder a, mo a, uh, a mediator in the Ukraine war. And, you know, that raised the question of China as a mediator. Uh, but, but a deeper question about India is um, how, you know, is... is has the war and India's position on the war somehow improved India's relationship with China, seemingly, because they have uh, something quite in a common? Lot. Yes, certainly quite a lot. Uh, not just because India's uh, view or India's attitude on this war, uh, but also there is another reason is that uh, um, the, uh, uh, the Indian distance itself from what American called the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Remember, that's the only thing Americans seem to have worked out in the more concrete sense. 
so-called Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, but India, of course, defending its own national interests. You know, saying what, what? You see, Indo-Pacific strategy is, for me, it's it's almost like a ridiculous concept, um, because Indo-Pacific, the the extreme uh, w w uh, eastern side, no, well, confused. Western side of the Pacific is the United States. The ex Indian Ocean side is India. These, that's the two major players are not a major player even in the region of Indo-Pacific uh, economic activities. They both reject the TPP or CDTPP, the, 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 the CTAP, and several other economic... Then American proposed some, some framework of economic cooperation. They put up something like eight, 800 million? <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like a joke. Uh, uh, they, they gave Ukraine 60 billion. Uh, they create a new economics is 800 million or something. It's it's absurd. So India has no interest seriously jump on that Indo-Pacific strategy. That that's the point. That that's the reason. More important for improving the relationship. Mm. Yeah. Hi. Um, yes. <laughs> you mentioned um, quite a bit about Chinese technical superiority over mm. Russia. Um, oh yeah, okay. You talk about mili okay. so mil I military. Okay, I never say everything. technical okay, go um, ahead. superiority, yeah. specifically about drones. Um, and you mentioned, you know, why there would not be a transfer of drones <coughs> from China to Russia. Um, I'm wondering, do you think the same logic applies to cyber attacks that would be harder to detect, um, or do you think that that is something slightly different? And if you do think it's something different, why do you think? that we are seeing this abject cybersecurity failure from Russia's side in the Russia-Ukraine war? Um, and why isn't China helping in ways that could be more surreptitious? Well, but the Russians, uh, yeah, but remember on, on the cyber side, Russians are dealing with uh, 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 Elon Musk. Uh, so it's a very different kind of uh, technology. The Russian has no, diff they, they, they couldn't deal with unless they shoot down. I mean, that's... But the Elon Musk project, if you know, Starlink is a project contracted with Pentagon, but it's a private company as well. So you know, Ukrainians, they, they can use it, right? The private company. You, so Russian cannot do much about the Starlink, as as far as I can see it. This is something very, very different. Now, say China help? How can China help Russians in the space? Or what what do we do to help Russia to? detect uh, Ukraine targets for Russians to... No, it's, it just doesn't make any sense there. Uh, uh, if Huawei is going to do that, of course Huawei will lose every contract in the world, not just the US, <laughs> Europe. No, it's not possible for Chinese to help Russia that way. No way. I, I don't see it. Yeah. Do, do, well, do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, okay, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean in terms of defense. Um, I meant in terms of attacks, which I think can be harder to disguise. It can be easier to disguise. You mean Russian cyber attack against Ukraine? Yes. But remember, the, the, the Starlink, it's very useful to detect a lot of things. Um, now, you cannot, if you cannot attack a Starlink, it does not work. You can bring down some uh, cyber infrastructure in Ukraine, the older ones, but you cannot touch the new ones they are using. See, militarily, that's what the reality is, as far as I can see, but there okay. I Just a dark question. Do you think <coughs> the Ukraine war should be avoided? Should, should have been, yes. Could have been, in fact, mm -hmm. yes. So what went wrong? What we're on, uh, my understanding. And, and are there lessons for the Asia Pacific? <laughs> uh, of course, there are lessons. What went wrong is diplomacy. Yes, that, that that's my view. They could have made a deal over this uh, Minsk tool. Basically, it's Minsk tool that break down, which means neutrality. Just Ukraine pledge neutrality. What's wrong with neutrality? Switzerland been doing that for hundred years, and uh, nobody attacked. Uh, it's a perfect situation for Ukraine to accept that. Uh, Zelensky, my understanding, is actually is warm to the idea, even shortly before the war started. Uh, 
you know, but he had some hope that the Russians would not do it, actually. You remember, they don't believe American intelligence, the Zelensky people. So, it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. Yes. Can you comment on, uh, sorry, I have about a million questions, so, but please, if, 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 raise your hands, <laughs> and, if, but uh, I, I would like to uh, ask questions all the way up to 5.30. But okay, my question, yep. okay, oh, well, one second, okay. right. quickly, uh, how about the Korean Peninsula and Japan? Uh, they, uh -huh. you know, you seem to have an increase of tensions since uh, February. Are they? You mean between whom? You mean between? The, uh, China or kind Russia? of across the board, uh, uh, but with Russia, but also potentially with China, do, do uh, like a consolidation of, uh, if you will, of bipolarity in the Asia Pacific. Do you think does that concern you or? Uh, yes, I, I think certainly concerned. The key here is uh, uh, South Korea. I would, I would say, what South Korea is going to do? Uh, the new president certainly moved much closer to a tougher position, you know, try to deal with the North. Um, but um, I, 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 don't, I don't see South Korea government can sustain that position for too long because the uh, Kim is, is not irrational, but he certainly, uh, uh, yeah, become a little crazy this year about the, look at the frequency of his, it, it could em end up with some accident, military, you know, conventional military accident between North and South Korea. So I don't think South Korean leadership uh, uh, will, you know, continue that kind of provocative from North's point of view. They, they will end up trying to find some way to talk to the North leaders. And some some Japan, have said Kim, Kim yeah. Jong-un is one of the biggest yeah. beneficiary of the Ukraine war. Yeah, yeah to some extent, yes. He, uh, he, sent, he actually sent weapons to, to Russia, that we know. And he um, probably even say, you know, this, uh, even sent a volunteer. Well, you know, Co Korean military is not bad. North Korean military actually is very good. <laughs> and extremely well-trained, tough, you know, fighters. Uh, uh, I believe Russians say no, no, because no. <laughs> you, you, you're not Caucasian-looking people, you have all the Asians going there, just like a Russian, Chinese ask Russians help during the Korean War in the 50s, Stalin said, no, 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 <laughs> we can only provide advices, we never go to the front, because the, the, you, you look European, right? so the American will start World War Three mm. with us. <laughs> go uh, ahead, go ahead. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, this is more of a question <coughs> regarding uh, domestic situations in China. Yes. So um, now that the Chinese economy is kind of slowing down because of its COVID policies, the housing market, the decline in uh, export competitiveness, and the right. U.S. trying to, and its allies trying to transfer the supply chain away from China. Yes. So how do you see the government trying to maintain its uh, legitimacy given that their primary source of legitimacy is undergoing some serious challenges and that currently the control of domestic political narratives is done definitely one of the ways that they're using? But yeah. do you see other alternatives? And uh, if there is no alternative, Alternative, how long do you think it'll last? You mean alternative uh, form of government? Uh, no, 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 alternatives policy? of uh, maintaining its legitimacy. And if there well, is no alternative, if they keep doing what they're doing currently, how long do you think <laughs> the strategy is going to last? Okay, well, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote the recent book, it's about legitimacy, so if you want my view. Uh, no, I, I, I define legitimacy <laughs> entirely different from what the Western political science theory about what legitimacy is. Right? I'd rather go back to, to Confucian tradition to, in, to, in the West, you want, okay, I can be very, I, I don't want to get carried away. Um, in the West, legitimacy is defined by space, basically. That's since the classic uh, Greece, as you know. You know, democracy, politics actually defined as a police. It's always defined as a little area. You can measure <laughs> uh, so call it police, then democracy, and so on and so forth. Uh, Chinese never had a space concept about politics and the legitimacy. That's, you know, uh, what they, they are doing is a time is important. Well, it's not space, but time. It's a dynamic process. Legitimacy defined by actual performance of each government, whoever they are. 
which government emperor or <laughs> man or woman, usually men in Chinese history, but a couple of wonderful women emperors. Now, if you can deliver what you promise, that is legitimacy. Now, you, you may not be able to deliver 100%. But even 6%, 70%, (laughs) what you promise, you have no problem. But if you cannot deliver, uh, overthrow uh, the government in China, the form of regime change has always been popular rebellion against government. This is how so-called dynastic changes in China. Confucius is not a conservative politician. I'm the one to try to rehabilitate him. He is the first person actually support the idea of legitimating popular rebellion against morally incorrect government. So therefore, from that perspective, you, sh- you need to define if the current regime in China, in Beijing, have they delivered? Is this morally bankrupt? Or what? Now, before you're doing that, then you can say, what's the alternative? What's the difficulty? Yes, economy, certainly we're running into difficulties. But from double-digit growth to five or something, you you, you say that's a major crisis. Uh, I would say a a little exaggeration to say that's an economic crisis, right? We haven't reached that point yet. Besides, the COVID policy is winding down. Once that happens, the rebound of all the activities uh, will be surprising. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so I have not seen one-party system at this moment running its course yet. Okay, that, that's my argument. Without m- defending the government, I don't have to defend particular person or so on. I have not seen yet. I have not seen yet. Yeah. But, but in physics, like space and time cannot be dissociated. Ah, uh, sure. Yes, that's what <laughs> mechanical. That, that's exactly mechanical. That's why. That's why Western political philosophy say divisions of power. You see, power actually can be divided into three spaces. Uh, that's the cri- uh, Well. Uh, I attack a lot in my book of Montesquieu. I blame everything on Montesquieu in the end. It's absurd from Chinese uh, uh, logic. You cannot divide power into three compartment (laughs) spaces. You want to keep a balance? You have to have a government who behave morally correct, uh, take care of people in general. (laughs) When you have a, a people in the country who split like this way. I'm sorry, I, 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 I love the United States, but I did not see, I did not believe I have a chance to see this. The country divide right in the middle. Mm. I haven't seen that in history since 1860. So well, maybe something I can, break uh, down. Let, I let me ask a related well, question just to close out the session here. If you're speaking of uh, moral legitimacy, uh, arguably, uh, the Putin regime is facing, you know, a, a very, uh, yeah. a very difficult uh, situation, and and many, I think, many Russians and, and many around the world would right. posit that uh, has, has the regime is morally bankrupt. So, question to you is, uh-huh. you know, how does China react? If if uh, the situation in Moscow becomes much more even tenuous, uh, if 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 the Kremlin is facing a regime threatening crisis, right. uh, w- what does China do? Does it? Uh, I basically say I, I I will say nothing. What what can what can they do? Mm. Um, it's um it's nothing. That, you know they cannot even help Putin if uh, Putin lost populism. But remember, Putin was elected with eighty percent. Okay, he may have lost another uh, 20 or maybe even uh, 30% now, but uh, still he is above uh, average compared with mm. any politicians in the world. So I don't know. Uh, if that did not happen, unless there is a coup d'etat, that's, that's a different issue here. Uh, if there is a serious coup d'etat... Is, is this something people in Beijing are talking about in Shanghai or no? 
Mm-hmm. I think they talk about it, but uh, how can you predict? You know, the, mm-hmm. uh, before Chinese Body Congress, there are even books in the West saying uh, the s- sensational story about coup d'etat against the Xi Jinping. But it's all imagination anyway. Yeah, yeah. These all imaginations, mm-hmm. but um, difficult to. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, so sorry. The one question is on online. Um. So the yeah. person. Uh. The person want to ask the. Um. Ba- ba- based on your arguments. Uh. he or she think the, Muay Thai, uh, the uh, the, the currency is worth rising. So it's right or not right. You mean Chinese? Which currency rising? Um. A, a U.S. versus Chinese. You is that they say? He not mentioned oh. the. What what country? But just the mention is the most high currencies world well rising. So, uh, well, is you, correct or it, not? Well, the recent phenomenon is the USD US dollar versus RMB rise quite a bit, but that's because of fe- Federal Re- Reserve policy is rising against Euro rise. Only that they, they did not rise is, uh, against the Swiss franc. I'm happy. Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm on Swiss uh, payment. <laughs> so, um, but what's the problem then? It's, a, it's you say affecting Chinese economy because the rising uh, of the dollar is what? Yeah, and, uh, and he impediment the one cent, uh, the, the one sentence. Uh, so, he's, uh, so he's saying that China and Russia are doing the giant huge projects in outer uh, space. So, oh, joint, joint project yeah. in space. We don't have an official joint space project, except we use each other's space station, you know, sometimes. I don't believe we have a real joint projects there. If I, maybe I'm wrong. Do we well, have I think, a I think there is a, the moon uh, discussion, <coughs> I, how, uh, how much it's been uh, put in concrete, I think it's, uh, it's still un- unclear. But I think unclear, uh, we're, yeah. we've come to the end of our session. Yeah. Thanks to those online who yeah. stuck with us, and, and uh, thanks to the audience here. For right. putting the time in, we did a lot of hard work, but I think we learned a lot from Professor Xiang, who, as you can see, is an a, incredible expert. So we'll hope you come back and visit again. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really, really enjoyed it. <laughs> Excellent questions. Yes.